give a warm Minnesota welcome to Phil Rosick. Thanks, uh, thanks uh, for the flattering intro and thanks to Scott. Thanks everybody at the MN Search Board and for all you guys for showing up today in this cold uh, spring evening. So yeah, I'm going to be talking about kind of a combination of local SEO and PPC. Um, I hope the title of my presentation sort of says it all. Um, uh, you know, basically the idea is like, what do you do when you've done the basics and don't know what to do next? You feel stuck. You're not sure. I don't know how many of you guys are like kind of small business owners yourself versus marketers. I think it's probably pretty much everyone does marketing. Um, are there any small business owners here who are just doing? Okay, we got a few. So, so I'm going to be kind of saying I'm going to be sort of referring to you collectively. When I say you know, okay, you're stuck in the local results, you don't know what to do. I'm referring to either you or your clients, sort of interchangeably. Um, Susan pretty much said everything there was to say about me. Uh, I'm about just uh, to give you a sense of where I'm from, uh, Massachusetts, about 30 miles south of Boston, and five miles south of the deflated football capital of the world, also known as where the Patriots play. <laughs> so there's, ever since Al Gore invented the internet, there's been a problem. Online marketing never seems to get any easier. You're going in circles, Google gets crazier by the year, algorithm updates, AdWords gets more sophisticated, new players come on the scene, new devices, your competitors get smarter, it, it's it's overwhelming, and sometimes your, your wheels are spinning and you just don't know what to do next. So I'm going to deal with, this is going to be sort of tactics to war. I'm going to kind of describe five situations that you might be in where you feel stuck, and for each of those situations, five things to do to get unstuck. Um, but before I do get into the sort of the tactics, um, I'd just like to comment really generally on what I, sort of how I see online marketing local marketing specifically, it should be kind of a launching pad for the rest of your marketing. In that it should you should be doing less and less of it over, you know, five years from now it should be a little easier than it is today. Or you might you shouldn't maybe have to do as much of it as you do today. It should it should, you know, in an ideal world bring you customers who talk to their friends. So it sort of launches word of mouth. Um, it should bring you customers who write you online reviews. It should not take up all of your time. And I think the reason it often does take up all of our time is that we, and I'm certainly guilty of this, tend to focus on kind of low payoff tasks, um, stuff that doesn't really move the needle, and if you're stuck, you just keep feeling stuck. So for me, the question is, you know, uh, so that if you don't want online marketing to feel like all you do, what are the highest payoff activities? Um, and by the way, so right now I'm going to get, I'm going to kind of go into five common situations where you might just feel stuck. But I'm going to go into five tactics that I, I feel are will help you get get unstuck in each of these situations. But if at any if at any point something's unclear or you don't know what I'm talking about, just shoot up your hand because um, uh, I I know we have sort of all we have a, a wide range of abilities and sort of. We have some marketers, small business owners, some paid search people, SEOs. So you know, just just let me know if something's unclear. So the, situa the first situation where you might feel stuck, your wheels are spinning, is you're not visible in the local results, or your client isn't visible. So for the record, here's what I mean by local results. I'm talking about. The Google Place is seven and a half, which is kind of obscured up here. This happened before. I think I typed in like Minneapolis auto repair. So you got the, the seven local businesses, and the organic results down here are localized as well. I mean, you can see that they are for Minneapolis businesses. So I say you're not visible on you're in the local results. I'm referring to these sort of collectively, both Google Places and the organic results. And of course, you have to map off. Off to the right up here, you got the you got the paid results off the, off the side, and usually paid results up here too, splattered all over the place. But I'm I'm kind of focusing on these. So show of hands, who who knows Moz.com? 
Okay, a lot of people. Of everybody you know, now who knows Ma, who is familiar with a, a service called Ma's Local? Okay, wow, pretty good. They, you may know, they do a variety of things. One of them is basically they do a quick, it's a free, it's, they have a paid service, but the free services, which is why I'm referring to you, they basically do a, they do a scan, a free scan of your listings and tell you, you know, okay, you're, you have a list, you, your business is listed on Google, but you're not listed on these 10 other sites. Here's what you need to do. But they have this really underappreciated free tool called the Category Research Area. Um, you just want to, if you just go to moz.com slash local, there's a button right at the top of the page. You can't always see it up there, actually. Um, it's, it's called Category Research. It is a gold map because you, you guys may know that for local SEO, one of the crucial steps is listing your business on a bunch of different sites, like not only Google Places, but Yelp, Yellow Pages, Super Pages, blah, blah, blah. The categories you pick, obviously, on Google Places page matter to your rankings. They really, they, they're your one opportunity to tell Google exactly what it is you do in a language that Google understands. So obviously those matter, but the categories on these other sites matter as well. So you can't really see this in this example. Um, I kind of do, I sort of butchered the screenshot, but I, I went to Ma, the category research area of Ma's local, and I typed in transmission shop. Let's just say I have a client who's a transmission shop, and I'm trying to figure out the best cat categories to pick for his local listings. So what, what Ma's local will do is you, you put in the kind of the, the type. Okay. <laughs> so basically, you tell Ma's local what your business type is, and then it will spit out. It will tell you on the left, okay, here are the main sites you're going to want to get listed on. Here are the categories you should pick. And notice, we got like eight different sites here. None of these categories is exactly the same. Okay, we've got transition shop, we've got transition shops, Foursquare, they kind of give you a choppy category here, the automotive shop. That's pretty big. But that's good to know if you are trying to figure out what is the best category to pick on your Foursquare page. So, so my first tip for, if you're just not visible on the local map, go to Moss Local, go to the category research area, and just play around. Figure out what are the best categories to pick for not only the Google Places page, but your other online listings too. This is sort of relevant. Um, who can tell me how, how many categories you can pick on a Yelp page? Close. ZZ Top is supposed to be a bit of a hint here. Three. Um, some people don't even know that you can pick any categories on Yelp. A lot of Yelp listings are auto generated and they just show up and they may be categorized as uncategorized. So at most, you know, people will pick like one Yelp category, but that's a shame because Yelp, by the way, Moz Local doesn't help you with Yelp. They will not tell you the best Yelp category to pick. If you go, if you go, if you type in Yelp categories list, I actually did a blog post about this a couple of years ago where I list all the Yelp categories. So you're going to want to pick out, you're going to really want to sweat your Yelp categories because I'm sure you've seen that when you type in a term like auto repair or dentists or restaurant, Yelp is like Google's golden child. Yelp is all over that page of search results. And the sad thing is, it's search results within search results. You, you will click on Yelp, and it will take you to a category page within Yelp, where they list all the auto repair places, all the restaurants. So that's huge. You want to, you want to be, you want to sort of piggyback off of Yelp's visibility. And the only, besides racking up the reviews on Yelp, basically the only way you can do that is by picking out the right categories. So you've got up to three categories that you can pick. So, this is sort of a this is sort of a part two to my previous thing about using models or its category research for that. You're gonna to want to sweat your Yelp category because they, they really do matter. Tip two, this is a quick win. Pile on the Google Plus reviews. A lot of people don't know that click through you know, which results get clicked on is actually a huge ranking factor. Um, my buddy Darren Shaw, who Susan mentioned a few minutes ago, did a study on 
basically which results rank. And it has a huge amount, he basically set up kind of like um, a robot to click automatically on results like hundreds of times a day. And what he found is that the most clicked on results tend to rise up in the rankings. So at least they, they, they usually don't drop out the local, sort of the local seven pack. So obviously reviews are not only I just need to turn you up a little bit. Oh, okay. Oh, okay, gotcha. Well, oh, I thought you turned off that noise. I was like, thank you. Um, so obviously Google Plus reviews are huge in their own right, because you just want to have reviews. I mean, rankings without reviews are a total waste. But they do, they can't indirectly help your rankings. So given that little tidbit, which one of these results do you think people are going to click on? The guy with 56 more reviews than the next guy. This is actually, this is actually a client of mine. Um, he's, he does home inspection. He's a one-man operation. Has seven kids to feed. He he has more calls than he can handle, and it's mostly because of his reviews. I mean, if, yeah, it's true that he's not number one. This guy, Comfort Spec Home Inspection Services, is number one. But it doesn't matter because of all his reviews. He's not only he's not only saved. He's always kept his local rankings afloat over the past couple of years, but I mean, he hasn't put knock on any of He is, you can bet, he is getting the lion's share of clicks. So, so my advice is pile on the Google reviews mercilessly. Don't have five more than the next guy. Have 50 more. And I think that the best way to do that is just make it easy for customers. Give them a one-page sheet of instructions, like a PDF, and. Even though Google doesn't make it as easy as they could for customers to write reviews, it's a numbers game. So you want to make it as easy as possible for them just by giving them clear instructions. Now, here's a free tool for you. If you, if, if you Google ByteSpark Review Handout or ByteSpark Review Handout Generator, you're going to see a tool that Darren and I put together a couple years ago where you go, you go to it and you Put in your client's information or, or your business info, you know, basically name, rank, serial number, and you can put a logo on that if you want. And it will create for you, a, it'll customize a PDF that you can just give to your customers, and it walks them through exactly how to post a Google Plus review. Um, and we have three versions. One is just desktop instructions, which is what, most, which is what you're going to be giving probably 90% of the customers. And also for the Google Maps app, because the only way to write a Google review on a smartphone. Well, pretty much the only good way to write a Google review on a smartphone is to use the app. Um, and then that there's actually a way to do it on to have somebody on a smartphone write a Google Plus review if they have a certain kind of link. So there's a sort of third handout that you, you probably wouldn't use. Um, but so the, but in any case, you have you have to choose some. And that's a free tool. I, I do offer them on my site. I, you can have me custom make them for you for like 20 bucks. But this is free. The instructions work, and I suggest you use it if you need if you want to rack up some Google reviews. Third quick win for local rankings. Create a page for every specific service you offer. No exceptions. Okay? Because it's very tempting to have sort of a, a broad, generic, you know, our services page. Well, that's not going to rank well in Google, because Google can't tell what it's about. And it's probably just a list like this of bullet points. On a lot of content. It's also tempting to have, like, in this example, just a big, big general dentistry page where you talk all about your general dentistry services, or to have a big prosthodontics page. It's fine to have those, but you need to have these guys too dental bridges, crowns, dental implants. You can link to them from the main page, but you have to have a granular page structure. That's the only way you're going to get kind of long. You're going to get that's the only way you're going to get organic visibility for kind of long term, oops, long, long tail keywords. And the nice thing about the well, two nice things about doing, doing it this way is that one, that's really high quality traffic because somebody who types in crowns is much deeper in the sort of the sales funnel than is somebody who types in dentists. That person is probably just kicking tires. Somebody who types in crowns probably knows what she wants and is you know, this close to picking a specific dentist. The other nice thing is that this kind of cross all of your PPC efforts are doing. Because these could be landing pages. Um, you know, if you're bidding on the term porcelain veneers, you're probably going to want to take people to a page all about porcelain veneers. So this is really this is another area where local SEO and pay-per-click really intersect. 
I'm just going to get a little more coffee here while you take in the lovely image. So I, I would say the fourth quick thing, um, the local rankings, if you, if you feel like your local rankings are just not like they should be, is get some lazy links. By lazy links, I mean links that don't require you to pump out a bunch of content or do a thousand dollar infographic or do a bunch of like PR outreach. That's a pain. And that, those aren't the only kinds of links you can get. Um, here are a few of my favorites, and these are pretty much applicable to every situation. Um, Chamber of Commerce. I mean, if you, the nice thing about that is you can be in one, you can be a member of more than one Chamber of Commerce, right? And maybe you don't want to pay that much for yearly dues, but the point is it's a possible link that you can get pretty easily. And every town, you know, even outside the U.S., has a Chamber of Commerce, so it's pretty much, it's always an option. And it's not just, you're not just chasing a link, you're not just paying for a link. Because there are, you know, there are offline benefits to being a member of the Chamber of Commerce. So don't ever, don't ever rule that out, because it's, it's a good, it's a good link to have. And you know, again, it, it kind of kills two birds with one stone. BBB accreditation. Um, I did a post about this, and a lot, it was sort of controversial because so many people hate BBB. And it is kind of a shakedown. Yes, it's a little bit of a scam, um, but you've got a good link out of your deal. Um, <laughs> and the nice thing is, if you're like a multi-location business and you have a bunch of kind of deep landing pages and you're trying to get links to those, BBB lets you pick out whatever page you want to link to in your BBB profile. So I, I'm not telling you to pay them 800 bucks a year just for a link, but if you don't have some visceral hatred toward the BBB, and you need some more links, and you don't really want to do a lot of legwork, it's just another tool in the toolbox. Industry associations. Pretty much every industry has one. Um, and you know they're usually pretty inexpensive to join. I think it's usually like 500 bucks a year. Um, for example, if you're uh, a remodeler, you know, you remodel homes, there's an industry for that. I was actually doing a consultation with a professional resume writer the other day. And lo and behold, there is actually an association of professional resume writers out there. There's only one that I can tell. So for her, that would be an easy way. Um, the last suggestion, and I should probably I should probably get through this a little more quickly, is meet the sponsor of meetup.com for um, who's familiar with meetup.com? Okay, so basically you have um, so probably half of you guys are familiar with it. You know, we have these groups that meet up locally in a given city where you know they talk about something. Um, you know, Minneapolis MongoDB user group, the horror show, whatever that is. Here's a little bit of a basically, like, you know, it's a group of people who meet up, and you know somebody has to buy the pizza and buy the donuts and buy the coffee and sort of sponsor them. You can be that sponsor, and you can get a good link out of the deal too. Um, Here's kind of a five second trick for finding those sponsorship opportunities. I don't know if you guys can see this clearly from, from there, but if you type in, if you do a, you know, a search operator and do site colon meetup.com, this group does not have sponsors right now, and then you sort of attend the city to the end, you will find local meetup.com groups that do not have sponsors. And the reason this works is that every group that doesn't have a sponsor has a page, this generic page hosted on meetup.com that says, this group does not have sponsors right now. So in this case, we pulled up 655 results in Minneapolis. Now, probably a lot of those are junk. And you know, if you con even if you contacted the sponsor and said, hey, would you like $150 for your next five meetups? We'd like to be your sponsor. Probably a lot of them would say no. But out of 650 results in Minneapolis alone, Somebody is going to want you to sponsor them. So that's an easy one for you. Okay, final tip about local SEO. I'm, on, I'm going to go through 25 different tactics. I'm only on number five, so bear with me. Don't build like 300 listings. Well, first of all, let me back up. Who knows what a local citation is? Okay, pretty good. So basically, an online listing in your business, whether it's on Yelp or SuperPage or Force or Whatever it is, name, address, phone number, website, URL, blah, blah, blah. A lot of people think that 
if you get three, you know, 100 to 200 to 300 of these lit online listings, you're going to go up in the rankings. It doesn't work that way. There is a real point of diminishing return of these. After you nail down about the top 30 to 50, you're not going to see any rankings improvement. So, you know, what I would suggest in this case, and this is going to free up hours and hours and hours of your time. Focus on the big sites that people have actually heard of, not the net hulks and chirps and poopalo of the world. Don't even bother with these. Focus on these, nail them, get them to get all the information correct, and then move on to something else. Yeah. So you touched on citations. Yeah. Can you just briefly touch on the consistency and how important that is? Oh, thanks. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up, Susan. Um, okay, who knows? Hmm. Well, maybe this shouldn't be a question. Basically, it does, citations matter in that Google look, Google doesn't sort of figure your Google Places ranking in a vacuum just based on what's on your Google Places page and on your website. They look at third party sources like Yelp, Yellow Pages, Super Pages, and a few other sites. And they try to triangulate. And if you have, if Google can't tell what your phone number is or can't tell what your address is or what, even what the name of your business is, you're less likely to rank well in sort of the, on, on the local map. Because Google doesn't have confidence that it's giving the users um, quality search results. So basically, the, the if you, you need to, List your, you have to have all your business, your main basic business information, name, address, phone number, website, consistent on a whole lot of sites. Um, you know, again, I would say the number is kind of 30 to 50. Don't go build, you know, don't go building 300 listings and expecting to rank. But what Susan brought up is a good point, which is that you need to be consistent with the information that you use on all those listings. So, so here's situation number two where you might feel stuck. Actually, just a minute. Did I make any sense just now? Um, okay, okay. I, I didn't know if I was just going off, off on one of my monologues. Okay, good. Um, by the way, please just shoot up your hand if you have any questions at any point. So, situation number two, where you feel stuck, is you might be ranking really well in St. Paul, but you want to rank well in Minneapolis, or vice versa. You, you have good local rankings in Minneapolis, you want to sort of get a presence in St. Paul, for example. How do you do that? Well, first, this, this, this one is very hard to describe, so just hang with me for a second. You, you should do what I call, if you're like one town over from the city, for one or two towns over from the city where you want to rank, it's possible that you could actually rank there if you play your cards right. You would do what I call stretch the map. Look at this map. This is, this is the search I typed in attorney in the location of Jackson, Tennessee. All the attorneys are down here, but there's this guy all the way up here. If he wasn't here, this map would be zoomed in on like downtown Jackson. But Google likes this result so much that it expanded the whole map just to accommodate this one lousy attorney. This, this isn't as much a tactic as just something to keep in mind, that if you're close enough to the city where you want to rank, you can do it if you... I can't I figure out exactly why some people are able to kind of quote stretch the map like this guy has, but at the very least, you want to do two things. One, pay attention to whatever that person is doing. Don't necessarily pay attention to, you know, if you're trying to kind of do competitive intel and sort of um, reverse engineer what your local competitors are doing so you can outrank them, don't necessarily try to reverse engineer, you know, A or B. Look at what this guy is doing. I think what you'll find more often than not is the person who stretched the business who stretches the map has better links. I mean, yes, unfortunately, links do still matter for the local results. Um, that's what I found. Your results may vary, but the key takeaway here is when you see if any of your local competitors are stretching the map, study that. Study that business. Look at their links, look at their citations, look at everything they're doing. Yeah? I, well, you know, I definitely would not go to Pfizer.com and buy, you know, 10,000 links, but, but like, yeah, exactly. I mean, the more kind of, quote, local, the better. So the opportunities I mentioned, you know, industry associations, especially local ones, because they're local, those are localized too. 
community you know, chamber of commerce. You know, if you can donate, if you can donate something to the local dog shelter or cat shelter or sponsor a sponsored living team, that's that's great too. So yeah, I would definitely prioritize local ones over this generic ones. Yeah, Adam. In terms of uh, treasure what's your thought on the expectation of self and conservative Yeah, great, great question. Um, I would, I would basically, I would list the zip codes or cities or however you want to kind of break it up, so that it, I wouldn't do it to the point that it's a footer that is this long at the bottom of the page, which a lot of people do. Um, I would do it in moderation. Uh, yeah, that, that's the short answer. But, you know, I'd love to talk about this more a bit later. But, um, uh, great question. Um, I, I don't even know. I mean, it, it does. I see a lot of people who rank well do that, but they shouldn't do it. Okay, create. Uh, if you're not ranking in the city you want, but you're, you know, you're a couple towns over, and there's a specific city where you want to get more local customers, create a few good city pages. Now, don't write one piece of content and then squirt out 50 pages and just swap out the city and expect to rank. And certainly don't expect, even if you do rank, don't expect to get customers from those places because they can tell that you're just paying lip service to their account. This is, I hate to admit this, but this page is actually belongs to a client of mine here in Minnesota. This page is ugly as sin, as you can tell. Okay, it's hard to read, the letters are small, dark background, it, just, it looks like a seven-year-old put it together. But, it, he talks a lot about he, okay, he's a landscaper. He lives probably 20 miles from Fight Fair Lake. Um, I guess that's a number of miles north of here. I'm not, I don't, I'm not totally sure. I'm not from the area, as you know. But in any case, he wanted more jobs in Fight Fair Lake. And he, he was not, his business is not located in Fight Fair Lake. So we created one page. We did not create 50 pages for the towns kind of around Fight Fair Lake. We created one page. And he goes, we go on and on about how he loves Fight Fair Lake, he loves the people, he loves the, the sort of environment. You know, he grew up near there and you know he went to vacation with his family and his kid on Fight Fair Lake. And then we have we sort of have a kind of see it in the screenshot, but we have pictures of some jobs he's done in Fight Fair Lake. A coupon for people in Fight Fair Lake. And this page actually goes down to like here. And this is this is not it. It is a long page, it took us a long time to work on it. But lo and behold, it ranks number one, right here, above the people who are actually in Fight Fair Lake. Um, and it, it wasn't always this way. And he started, when he first built the page, he was down to like number 10, then a few weeks later, you know, number seven. He slowly crept up the page. And he's been here at the very top for about three years. And he actually gets jobs as a result of this page. I think we do some AdWords for Fight Fair Lake too, but the point is, quality over quantity. We did not squirt out 50 pages. We simply made one page and made it really, really good. So think of a genuine connection with the place that you want to rank and write a page where you, you, you give it your best pitch for why you want jobs there, you know, talk about jobs you've done in the past, etc. You just go do it. And this is sort of a, an add-on point, I think it's kind of separate, but there's a distinction. Try to think of page, pages that you can create to target a city where you're not actually located. Don't think about them as city pages necessarily. You might want to position them as portfolio pages where you are not talking about, well, well, we love Fight Fair Lake for reasons X, Y, and Z. You're talking about a specific job. There's this painter I worked work with once in sort of Boston area. There's this, he has this crappy little page which is kind of keyword stuff, and he only has one job that he shows on it. But it actually ranks in the top on page one for I think like Cambridge exterior painters. And he could probably he could probably push up like number two on in the organic things if he actually worked on the page a little more. And he has a lot of junk on his site, a lot of pages that aren't this good. But the point is, don't necessarily think about this, creating city pages. See if you can talk about specific jobs you've done. And create kind of position in this portfolio. This one is really tricky. Um, I'm tempted to just say that we should talk about it kind of during the QA, but I, I'm just going to gloss over it briefly here. 
consider targeting the state level. Don't try to become, don't try to rank well within your city and the next city and uh, other neighboring cities. Try to go, try to optimize your site for the state. This is very tricky because Google, Google doesn't, it's impossible to tell us how Google ranks some businesses for state funds, like you know, Rhode Island remodel. I think that's, I guess the example here is Rhode Island wedding photographers. Because as you can see here, I mean, this is Rhode Island, so it's not a big place, but the results are from all over, all over the place, not the same town. But sometimes Google, will, if, you, if you type in like, Lawyer Minnesota. Sometimes Google will grab all the local results from just Minneapolis or just St. Paul. So sometimes they're from all over the place. Sometimes they're from one specific city. And you can't really engineer that, but it, it's worth giving it a try. If you if you have kind of a big service area that you're trying to cover, and you know maybe you rank well in your town, but you're trying to kind of cover ten sort of a cluster of ten cities, consider targeting the state. Um, yeah. I, I would, yeah, I mean, you're kind of, you're basically going after organic rankings, so there, you know, domain is going to be a factor. Um, but I think you have a better shot with an age domain that presumably ranks well for other terms. Um, but yeah, I mean, you're going after, you're going after organic rankings for the most part. The nice thing about targeting at stake rather than you know, targeting a bunch of cities and just hoping that you rank in all of them, is that people from all parts of the state are going to type in Rhode Island wedding photographer. Now granted, most people will just type in wedding photographer, but some, set of, some subset of people will just include the state, either the two other abbreviation or the whole state. And everyone in this, there are some people throughout the entire state who are going to do that. So you're sort of drawn from a, lar a wider pool of people. Um, this is kind of a big can of worms, but I just wanted to bring up the idea of part thinking state instead of city. The last tactic, this is sort of the last quick thing, and this isn't really a local, this isn't really an SEO, this isn't really a bit of advice on SEO, but you can optimize until you're blue in the face, and you, you still might not rank either in all the cities you want or in the state you want. So, you know, Get some of those lazy links, you know, create the kind of granular page structure that I that I described. Do all the on-page stuff that you, you already probably do. Um, but recognize that you might still have to fill in the gaps. And the best way to do that in my experience is with paper play, which by the way I'm going to talk about a little more in just a couple minutes. So you're ranking well. Oops. Okay. You're ranking well, but your phone is collecting dust. Why? What can you do about it? You know, you're ranking well organically, you have Google Places rankings, maybe it's, you're even ranking in the city you want. But the phone's not ranking. Okay, pop quiz. Yelp reviews show up on which other, which three local search engines? Yeah. Yahoo. Bing. Bing. One more. Anybody? Insider. In, sorry? Insider. Very close. All the business. There you go. No, no. <laughs> Apple Maps. So what I mean by that is if you have one review on Yahoo and no reviews anywhere else, when somebody goes to your Apple Maps listing, they see one Yelp review. There's no such thing as an Apple Maps review at this point. So they, Yelp feeds reviews to Apple Maps. Likewise for Bing, although sites like Demand Force and City Search, I think, also feed into Bing. Um, and of course, Yahoo piggybacks on both of these. I and mean, Yahoo grabs Bing search results and Yelp's reviews. Um, so actually, this is kind of a bit of trivia. I hope you found it interesting because it's kind of beside the point that I really want to emphasize, which is what do people see when they search for you by name? As you can tell, this is a brand new SERP. Okay, so I'm looking, I typed in a specific business. And this, these guys are actually just down the road for me. Marshall Building and Model. Look, look at their reviews, okay? Google reviews, Yelp, 
VBD, and by the way, Better Business Review, local reviews are actually pretty new. I don't think they even existed a year ago. But look how high BBB ranks for this brand, this brand name search. Facebook, Facebook doesn't have the review stars showing up in the local, in the, search, in the search results, but they actually do have reviews on Facebook, which are also relatively new, by the way. Howls.com. I think they have more reviews, too, down the page, but this is all that I could grab. But the point is, say I type in remodeling, and I'm looking for a local remodeler, and I think, okay, these guys look good. I'm going to check them out. You know, what do, what do potential customers see when they search for you by name? Because you can bet that they will. That even if they found you and you're ranking number one for remodeling, and you're ranking number one in all the cities you want, they are going to search for you by name. And when they do, what will they see? Will they, will they just hear crickets chirping, or are they going to see all of these reviews? So what my tip is, diversify them. Get reviews on more than one site, not just Google, not just Yelp. Try to get some of these guys too, BBB, Facebook, Hows. Um, I will talk about reviews a little more later, but this is, like, this is probably the biggest point, probably my number one suggestion. If you have good rankings, but you don't have good, uh, you don't have good kind of inflow, influx of new customers, diversify your reviews. Another tip, very, very similar. You go to all this work to acquire a customer and to do a good job for them. And then you, you even ask them for a review and they probably said no, but some, probably five or 10% of people actually say yes. So to get, a, to get a review in the first place is hard work, but your, that, your job is not done. They already, they wrote this review for you. So now your job is to study it, study the hell out of it. Look, at, look, look for buzzwords, look for complaints, look for, see, see kind of, how to put this? Do, do customers talk about the things you expect them to talk about? Like here, I've highlighted examples. This is, I'm going back to my example of a home inspector client of mine. So this is a Yelp review for the home inspector. Um, this lady's talking about, she's saying who she is, she and her fiance are first time home buyers. So that tells me, okay, we should probably, you know, if we're not already targeting first time home buyers and sort of speaking their language, we, we should either play that up on our pay per click ads or create a page about first time home inspections. Because um, she's saying exactly what her kind of demographic is. She, how what made her choose my client over somebody else? all the reviews. She says so right here, after reading all the great reviews, blah, blah, blah. One, one of his, his USP is that he offers a 90-day warranty, it's actually now a 100-day warranty, and a 200% money back guarantee. And on his site, we talk that up. Every page mentions his guarantee and his warranty, and we mention it in, our, in the AdWords ads too. So it's nice to see that, the thing that we expected to draw customers in actually does draw them in, and the customer ends up writing a five-star Yelp review. So there's some other examples of kind of things you can mine and sort of study and take away from your reviews, but the point is, once you get a review, that's not the finish line. You have to study that review, dissect it, um, you know, put on your rubber gloves and just, you know, stick your arm into that review and see what comes <laughs> out. Um, because you can learn a lot, you can get content ideas, you can figure out how to sort of that. tighten up your, um, your pay-per-click ads, it, all of the above. Okay, Crazy Egg. Who, who is familiar with the tool called Crazy Egg? Okay, about half, half of people. So Crazy Egg basically is a, it's a, a great tool. It is worth its weight in gold. It's like nine bucks a month. And it shows you a heat map of, you install on your site and it shows you a heat map of where people click and where they don't click and where they scroll and where they don't scroll. And it doesn't have to be just links. Like if you have something that looks clickable that isn't, that doesn't actually hyperlink anywhere, Crazy Egg will show you if a bunch of people are clicking on that and just basically wasting their time and being frustrated. So it is an amazing tool and you should use it in general. But for this specific purpose, create a giant FAQ page load it up with questions that you think your customers ask or that you know for a fact that they ask. Make the questions clickable so that pe people who actually have the question and want to see the answer click the link. 
and kind of drop down, I guess you could use like jQuery to do this. You drop down and find the answer while on the page. If you, if, you, if you see what I mean about the heat map, you can see that a lot of people click on this question. Do you have a minimum charge? So th this, is the this is a page on one of my client's sites. And you know, we should probably take this page and talk up you know, on the home page, sort of talk up more prominently the fact that he actually does have a minimum charge. Um, how, what exactly you die, what exactly you get out of putting crazy egg on an FAQ page <clears throat> and then studying it, who knows? Because um, it's gonna differ from client to client. But the point is, create an FAQ page and then mine it with crazy egg. F figure out what people's hot button issues are. No wispy little anorexic pages. Two paragraphs of content. Make them long. Not just, don't just go on, don't just add dribble, don't pay somebody on Fiverr.com to you know, spin content for you. But when you have a service page where you are trying to talk somebody into picking up the phone, make it long. People who are, who are kind of skimmers can always back out of it if they want to. They don't have to read the whole thing. You can make it very long, but also very readable. Um, but for people who want a lot of detail, give it to them if they want it. Um, the, the other benefit is that you, you give Google more to sink its teeth into. Google, I mean, this sounds like total Stone Age SEO advice, but Google does like long content. If only because, you know, people who go... Ten minutes. Ten minutes, oh boy. Yeesh. I be better pick it up here. <laughs> okay, the advice is make your pages long with good stuff, okay? <laughs> Great tool, Qualaroo. It's basically a pop-up survey that you can put in the bottom of your pages. And you get to ask customers questions. You could ask them 10 questions, you could ask them one. I mean, there are any number of ways you can use Qualaroo. This is an example from my site where I ask cut, um, visitors three specific questions to sort of identify themselves. But it's a great tool because you can time it so that it doesn't pop up as soon as somebody lands on a page. It, you can make it so that only pe when people scroll down or they're on a page for one minute, only then do they see the survey. It's a great way to identify who is on your page, what are they looking for, did they find what they were looking for, etc. It's kind of expensive. It's like 80 bucks a month, but you, can, you know, you can, I would suggest in that case, use it for a couple months and ditch it. Or, you know, if you found it really useful, keep using it. Because it, it, it's, it's all like crazy and it's very high payoff. Okay, situation number four, where you might feel stuck. You're doing AdWords for your clients. You might actually be doing pretty well. Your, ad, your ads might be converting. But you feel like Rocky Balboa here. You, you're, you're bleeding money. It's costing too much. How do you get the same results with, and pay Google a little bit less? One suggestion is use wildcard. Basically, dig up long tail keywords with wildcard searches. Here's what I mean by that. Either you, you probably need to use quotes around the whole search term, but um, if you use an underscore either before the whole search term or between keywords, or you use an asterisk, I'm actually not sure of the difference um, on a practical level. You will see, it's sort of auto, it's Google autocomplete in reverse. You will see instead of, you know, if you type in installing pool, then Google gives you a bunch of keyword suggestions that have you know, words other than installing pool at the end of it. You see what goes, you see what people type before installing pool. So, did that make any sense, by the way? Okay, good. <laughs> it's hard to explain, but the idea is it's another way of digging up long tail keyword searches other than relying Google Keyword Planner, which in my opinion sucks, and relying on autocomplete. So give wild cards a, a try. Bid on review terms. I'm gonna keep this one real short because I think you see exactly what I'm saying. If you don't wanna pay 18 bucks to, to bid on the term cosmetic dentist or NYC dentist, bid on dentist reviews or cosmetic dentist reviews if you want to go really niche. And the nice thing about this is yes, although it's lower search volume, again, these people are farther along in kind of the buying process. They are, they're past the tire kicking stage and they are looking 
uh, they want to see reviews. So create a page on your site where you, um, you play up your reviews. And at the very least, bid on the terms and show off your reviews on as many, in as many ways as you can. I, I'll, I'll describe that in a minute, but the key takeaway is don't think just key, you know, keywords in terms of service. Think keywords in terms of service plus reviews. Stop talking about how great you are and let your customers start talking, okay? So put, put testimonials on your landing pages. Put reviews on the landing pages. Either, if you don't put the reviews themselves on the landing pages, at least put like logos or links where people can read the reviews if they want to. Now this won't directly lower your AdWords spend, but it's all about attracting customers. And this, if, you know, if people go to your page where you just talk about yourself and they have no indication of that you have happy customers, you're wasting your time. But um, I'm going to actually skip this point. Um, maybe, I mean, I guess I'll allude to it very briefly. If you want to help your organic rankings and you have testimonials from customers on your page, mark it up with schema, okay? So that you get these nice little review stars showing up the way they, the way they do for that the um, quite barely landscaping client I told you about earlier. Quick point here, test with Bing ads, okay? Bing costs about one-sixth or one-eighth what Google does. So use it as sort of your laboratory, okay? Test fearlessly, you know, um, I think Larry Kim uses the word unicorn ads to describe ads where you, know, you see click-through rates of 20% or more. Use Bing ads to figure out, to experiment until you find a unicorn ad, and then roll it out to Google. You'll, you'll probably see the same results. Okay, this is kind of a complex point. I have this client called Trinity Inspection, okay? Pretty generic name. He, he's a home inspection company. There's also a Trinity Inspection in Chicago and Dallas. He was getting some clicks from Chicago and Dallas. He's in Pennsylvania. So I added as negative keywords, Chicago and Dallas, so that he was, not only is he not getting clicks, but he's not getting impressions for people who are searching for the other Trinity inspections in the US. Okay, last situation where you might feel stuck. You're getting, you have good rankings, I hope. You have customers, but you can't get them to speak up and write, put in a good word for you online. So the question is, how do you get them to write online reviews? Number one tip, give them choices. The, if you're a divorce lawyer or a bankruptcy lawyer or a psychotherapist or even like a resume writer, to, to allude to that example I mentioned previously, your customers may be willing to write you a review, but they don't want to use their full names, either because they're embarrassed or they don't want an employer to find out or whatever. So, Google Plus and Yelp, don't force Google Plus and Yelp down their throats, because they require full names. Give them options. City search, you can use a totally bogus name if you want to. Now, yeah, it's not as credible, but it's better than having no online review at all. Yelp pages, same deal. Inside pages, I think you can use sort of an alias if you want. And these industry-specific sites, like health grades, you know, for, um, Basically, patients don't have to use their full names if they're reviewing a doctor who uh, cured them of some horrible, unspeakable disease. Obviously, they can leave an anonymous review on these sites. Sites that accept Facebook logins, so you're not asking somebody, if you want somebody to write a review on Foursquare, you're not asking them to go create a Foursquare username. They can simply log in using Facebook. Did somebody have a question? Sorry, I thought I saw a hand go up. So give people choices, ideally somewhere between three to five. You know, one good one is always Facebook. Obviously Facebook accepts Facebook usernames. Ask people twice for a review. Two points of contact. You don't, you're not making a pest of yourself if you ask them in person, say for a review, and you provide that machine of instructions that sort of walk them through the process, and then send them a friendly follow-up email as a reminder. That, that's, that's not obnoxious and you should do it because people forget just because they haven't written you an online review doesn't mean that they won't. So always ask twice. Um, 
my favorite method, by the way, for doing this is use a review handout of the type I described earlier and this tool called Get Five Stars. L look it up. Um, the other, another tip I have about reviews is subliminal messages, okay? Expose people to them all the time. Saturate them. Put their reviews in their, put your reviews in their faces. Not, not in some obnoxious sense, but just play them off, show them off. Like in this example, you can actually go to a Google Plus review that a customer has written you and have it show up in your posts stream on your, your local Google Plus page. You basically reshare it. It shows up not only in the About column in your Google Places page, but also in the Posts column. So it, you're, you're doubling the number of places on your Places page that that review shows up. And obviously, assuming it's a good review, you're going to want to do that. Don't be shy to play up your reviews on your home page. This guy, this is an cl old client of mine. He's a mortgage broker. He is a beast. He has like 100 reviews on all, like five or six different sites. And look, this is his home page right here. Here's his mug. Here's sort of info about his USP. He's playing up his Angie's List reviews and his Kudzu reviews. He has a lot of them. He's not afraid to do that. And he's showing them off. And he's sort of conditioning people who become clients of his to write a review and they become happy clients too. So he's exposing them early and often to his online reviews. Have a reviews page, put them all on there. Um, contrary to popular belief, you can actually copy and paste Google reviews and they won't get filtered on your places page. So you consider it, but have a whole page where you have all your reviews or at least link to all the sites where you have reviews. Um, have, have, a link, have a link or several links in your email signature to sites where you either have reviews or want reviews or some combination of the two. Now, I'm not wild about this email signature because of this obnoxious banner here. So here's a purely fictional example. If I had in my email signature links to review sites where I have reviews, I would do this, real understated. It's easy to miss, it's not in your face, but people, it's giving people a message, hey, you know, nudge, nudge, I wouldn't mind a review. Um, this, is a, this is a tricky one. If you are just stumped and you can't get happy customers to speak up, consider asking non-customers. And I don't mean ask mom to write you a five-star review. I mean, if, if you're a lawyer and you did pro bono work for somebody, that person is a legitimate reviewer, in my opinion. I guess there's, there's a debate to be had about this. Um, if you did a free consultation for somebody, that, you know, I think a review from that person is, appro is appropriate, provided that you know, he or she makes clear that, you know, they aren't paying clients. They did a free consultation and they're reviewing you on that basis. But they can, they, can talk, they can talk about you legitimately as a professional. Again, it's not mom giving you a five-star review. So, uh, you know, another, you know, going back to the lawyer or doctor example, you know, peers can write a review too. You know, again, as long as they disclose who they are and what their relationship to you is, not only will the review not get filtered, generally speaking, but at least in my opinion, that, that's perfectly ethical. Sort of a last resort. Last point, experiment fearlessly. Again, just because customers haven't written you a review doesn't mean that they won't. Um, you're not gonna get it right at first. You're gonna ask probably 20 people and maybe one will write you a review, but stick with it, okay? Try emailing people twice. Try sending them a snail mail request where you give them instructions and say, hey, we'd love a review from you. Um, tinker around with it until you get reviews, because you can you, you, you can and will do it if you just stick with it. Okay, so that was 25 tactics. I hope I didn't I hope I didn't breeze through them too fast or spend too long on any one. But here are my here are sort of my top picks. These, I think, no matter whether you are dealing with AdWords clients or pay-per-click clients or sort of clients with a big service area where they're trying to rank in more than one town, where you're talking about a client who's just trying to rank in one town. Whatever the situation, I think these are the seven things you can do today, no matter what, to get unstuck. So use wild cards for keyword research. I sort of explained that. Granular page structure. So don't just have one long services page where you, um, you, you break it out into specific services. Get those long tail rankings. Show off your reviews. I just described that. 
Get reviews, get reviews on diverse sites, so not just Google, not just Yelp. Go for get Facebook, get some industry specific, get some sites on industry specific. Yeah. Get some reviews on industry specific sites like Health Grades, Zillow, Avo, whatever the case. Study those reviews so you know, when, you know, basically, um, so you, you know who ends up reviewing you. Um, I sort of described that, so I, I won't dwell on that point either. Make epic pages, not only for Google, um, but for people who actually want more detail. And you know, again, they can always skim it if they want, but give them detail if they want it. Create a giant FAQ page and then mine it with crazy egg. I described that too. Um, so anyway, th these are, I would say, the top seven tactics that no matter what your situation is, they will help you not only get, uh, you know, reduce pay-per-click spend, um, get better rankings, and we hope get better cut, we get more and better customers. So anyway, that's it for me. You guys rock. Thank you.